See, there are so many needs out there. Only when it has been translated into a firm set of requirements that you and I get the opportunity to invest our time, earn money doing it, and finally have a sense of fulfillment having done it right. Because we want evidence that it did satisfy that human need which was so well defined. Before it is put into specifications like requirements, we cannot do much about it. And if we do anything about it, unlikely we will solve the design problem as the user or the person who first uh, identified the need thought about it. Now, what do we do after that? So, some of us will start thinking about synthesis, right? So, we synthesize it, and when you synthesize, we also start looking at volumes. So, how many homes in Delhi? If you really made a good product, how many people would need that product? You know, you'll go to the population, you'll estimate some average uh, size of the household and come to a number. And then you'll also estimate how soon people are willing to buy. So you'll make some forecast about it. And then when you're designing it, you'll keep in mind that it has to be something which can be manufactured. So commonly, I mean, if I, if I go by my experience of air purifiers, the ones that are available in the market are very expensive when you want to replace the filter. So you start thinking of what is something which can be cleaned, washed, reusable. So you, you'll think about that. And then you'll think about what material comes in handy. So you might think of stainless steel. <coughs> you might think of some other material. You might think of a fabric which is woven, which has the same ability and it is washable. Or something which can be just you know, cleaned with a vacuum cleaner and then put back. I don't know. So, so you start thinking of but something which is available, which can be manufactured, for which there will not be a resource constraint. So that needs to be integrated. Now this, the end user never told us. So people who need clean air didn't tell us that it has to be manufacturable. We are putting in the constraints now. Suitable materials, plastic, metal, fabric, appearance and user interface. So most of the time when we interact with the home appliance, we are happy using it. We normally find on off button or what to change if it is fan speed, it is uh, cooling temperature. Right. Now, we have to understand what the customer is looking for in an air purifier that he has not stated and some of the constraints that will enable us to make it a marketable product. What is the life expectancy? How long is the user going to keep it for? And then frequency of service filter needs to be replaced once in a month, once in a year, what will be the cost, any codes and standards that we need to comply with. See in India, we don't have that concern as much as it is in the US where there are laws which mandate that the manufacturer is liable for whatever is produced and if there is any hazard, meaning life or uh, property or anything, then he has to compensate the user. Then what are the noise expectation? So I just mentioned, you know, I was sensitive to the noise from the laptop fan. When you're wanting to sleep, you're going to be more sensitive to noise. And if your air purifier is going to be used at night, we need to anticipate what level of noise will be acceptable to the user. What about lights? You switched off the lights and the filter indication is bothering you. So all of this, if we think through, we are likely to address it when formulating the problem. So the constraints and the needs together. So we have some experience and let's say we get together. I have experience, you people have some new ideas and, and we start making a solution. So the first thing we do is we'll buy things available in the market. Or before that, we'll ask some approval, right? Stakeholders are willing to invest money with us so that we explore what is possible. The government may be interested, some company may be interested, or we may pull together our funds. Once we have that, we'll start doing activities like benchmarking. And then, more than one feasible solution if available. Now, in this problem, we know there are feasible solutions. Then, there is no problem. We can move forward and synthesize the product. But there could be scenarios where there is no feasible solution. So there's one, uh, I think you pointed out something, right, for which I didn't have a feasible solution? the book going back into the rack, right? So it could be that uh, 
the design team gets together, explores options, and say that we couldn't reach the point you wanted because you wanted in the shelf at the exact same location that you picked it from. And we find that it is possible using a CNC machine, but it's going to be bulky. It will add more to the house than the bookshelf itself. And uh, so we come back in terms of definition. Now look, this is not possible, but this is. So you make an attempt to satisfy a modified form of the requirements and whether it will still satisfy that need. Now, analysis and optimization efforts may also lead to additional information which could lead to redefining the problem. So we, we said certain things and then we find that a small compromise can lead to a lower cost, say half the cost. So we want to go back, rediscuss. Or we get a major feature or performance ben benefit, which is saleable. Right? Like we're talking about filters selling at anywhere between 10 and 25,000 or 10 and 40,000. And we say, like here, we have a design which is going to sell at 60,000, but it will never require a filter replacement. You want to go back and forth and use the optimization phase and therefore those links between different uh, parts of the you know, design process. And we've already said that it is an iterative process. Then we come to evaluation. So if we did all this back and forth between definition of requirements, synthesis, optimization, analysis, and we've come to a design. Again, continuing with the air purifier example, we have a design which now is working. Or the design team think it is working. What next? So the, the best way, I mean, if we are working in a large um, organization, then the best way is to have a validation process to the extent possible, independent of the design team in terms of results and everything else, but managed by them. So what you do is you create evidence. You said you will have CO2 below a certain PPM. And we also talked about what is the extreme environment in which it needs to work. So we create artificially an environment which has a high level of CO2 and we put this um, system. And does it or does it not meet the objective? Same thing for the more riskier uh, components of uh, CO, wax and uh, what was it? Sulfur dioxide and uh, NOx, right? So all those, we will create tests to validate does the product do what it said it is supposed to do. And what can happen as a consequence of all this? We might discover that the design team was too enthusiastic. When they said that CO levels will drop, they did not take a large enough um, size of um, volume of air containing a polluted gas. That could be one. Or they did not do it on enough number of pieces. So one piece, for some reason, performed very well. And we got the CO2 levels where we wanted. But in, in, in if we take a, a statistically significant sample size, we are not getting there. Now, some of this is not as interesting as it was when we were talking about the creative phase of formulating the problem. It may not be as interested as it was when we are optimizing, looking for alternatives. But then the rigor of design is that you cannot escape this process. Whether you want to make money for yourself, you want to help another company make money, or you want to do social work, satisfying a need, irrespective of which of these you're working for, you will need to demonstrate that the product meets its objective, design intent. And what do we do for all this? Field trials is one option. So some of the things that, uh, for example, life of a product, will it work reliably? Noise, now we, we're talking about noise levels we can measure in a noise test room, but quality something more to do with human perception. And there will be a set of variables that we cannot capture doing laboratory testing. So if those are going to be significant, if we anticipate that customer choice of the product is going to be driven by those, then we might as well do a pilot field trial. So 100 units sent across a different category of the population. Say you give some to people who have just five members in the household, people who are staying just two people and all that and see what are the reactions. You give it to a set of sensitive people and you give it to people who are not uh, very sensitive but very, you know, quick with things. They want things working quickly and 
you strategize. I don't know what all you will include, but you strategize to make sure that you have a higher fulfillment rate of the human need. You can also then do focus group studies. People who used it, you talk to them and look for clues on what's missing. And then also maybe a, a check on whether there are enough components that suppliers, vendors around can supply. See, so at this point it begins to become more a disciplined approach than a creative approach. And then uh, when we go to manufacture the product, we want every product to fulfill a certain set of specifications and defined tolerances. So no two pieces are going to be exactly alike. So we need to measure what is the process capability. Again, do some pilots and those are manufacturing uh, process quality oriented uh, trials to determine. Now we come to refrigeration and air conditioning, the subject that we are going to touch upon. So within the subset of mechanical engineering design, uh, we have uh, refrigeration and air conditioning. And when we look at um, air conditioning, we could begin to think of where all are we interacting with one thing or another. So all of us have interacted with a domestic refrigerator. Right? We have experienced an air conditioner. We have gone to malls where some of the commercial or large industrial uh, chillers are used and all that. So in our daily lives, we have a lot of interaction with things to do with refrigeration and air conditioning. Now, I want you to get a sense of the relative energy consumption of some common household appliances and see where the air conditioner sits within them. And there's a reason for that. So do you more or less agree with what values I put here? So now let's do a calculation. So are you guys, some of you are carrying calculators? Uh, phones can be used, right? <coughs> so let's look at uh, first a, a TV and we make some assumptions. So let's make an assumption that uh, this is a, a one bedroom house where a couple is staying together, right? So why? Because then it will allow us to assume the number of lights, geysers and stuff like that. So how long you think the TV will be used? Make a guess. So 100 watts into, I'll make be liberal, 3 hours. Into 3. And then let's make an assumption 365 days. And this is more a representative calculation for you to get a sense. So can someone give me the kilowatt hours here? 109.5. Okay. Let's look at the refrigerator. So we will then again take, let's take 80 watts. And we're going to use it 24 hours into 365 days. How much? 700.8. Now look at AC. So we're going to use 1600 watts, and for 1600 watts, I'm assuming a 1.5 ton air conditioner, right? And we will make an assumption of how many air conditioners? Uh, Two. Two, right? So let us assume one, and let us assume one, and at the same time, we will factor in the number of hours that it is used. Right, so in, uh, indirectly we will get that sense. So I want to make an assumption here, while it may be used more than 8 hours, but the compressor may not run 8 hours, so for purposes of averaging and just to get a sense, we say 8 hours, you know 365. No, we are saying let it be. They are a very energy uh, conscious couple and uh, if they are in the bedroom, then they will uh, switch it off and if they are in the... Okay. So, it's good. Half kar deta. 180 days? I used to think like that when I was um, handling design and when I was doing some of these calculations, but I discovered then that uh, people start using it in March and continue using it till uh, end October. But, uh, <coughs> 
if you use it like a heat pump yes yeah yeah no but let's let's factor it let's make it half so let's look at you will use the ac in the months of uh, april may june without doubt april may june no one has a doubt right july august september i have personal experience i can't do without using it so six months are uh, are there right so let's do this how much is it 2336 and what are you left with now lighting see given the emphasis on energy efficient led lights uh, i would propose 12 watts and we can say four lights right and then how many hours Six hours, okay. Six hours. I think uh, is too much, huh? Chalo, what do you want to say? We will put in what? Ten hours. So what you can do is this is a simple Excel sheet that most of you can do by yourself, and you can develop some insights and come back next time. So with whatever we did, we have reduced from somewhere like eighty percent to seventy-three, seventy-four percent. The the cost of energy 74% of the cost of energy is on uh, because of the air conditioner and we have kept the refrigerator aside i think um, we haven't taken that yet so it is only going to increase so refrigeration air conditioning together contributes to a big part of the and that is the reason why we see that air conditioners are the last home appliance to become popular if you look at a trend chart people start buying refrigerators buying tvs but air conditioners come in last is because people already are aware of the cost of running an air conditioner so we go back i just want you to have this in mind 20000 approximately one 1.5 ton split ac with a high energy efficiency rating so 1600 <coughs> power consumption is is not easy to get the standard 3 star product will probably be more that was for you to have some context as to why we are going to look at system efficiencies uh, and the impact on environment as we go forward on the slides the background knowledge of the cost of running is important to appreciate the significance of energy efficiency for air conditioners you know when carnot wrote his first uh, paper or um, first communication about uh, this he talked about the motive power of fire it was a french um, um, article and it translated in motive power if you look at thermodynamics the word thermo heat dynamics motion movement so start looking at these two and you'll see that there is an interrelationship between heat and work the first law essentially what it is saying is that when you move from one state point to another state point there is always a relationship between heat transfer and work done in a reversible system that's all that is so, so if you relate to it like that you will always be aware that there is a connect between heat thermal and movement work now what the first law never says is that you have to lose some heat before you can get some work so that's where the second law of thermodynamics comes in so if you had um, energy in the form of heat let's say you have some something at uh, 600 degrees kelvin and and you want to convert all of it to work the first law allows you to convert all of it to work but the second law says that there is a penalty you'll pay you have to lose a part of that to a sink and only then can you generate flow which will lead to creating work and then we have the carnot cycle which almost defines that penalty the best system will never have an efficiency higher than the carnot cycle efficiency for an engine and when we come to refrigeration air conditioning we start looking at the inverse carnot cycle now if we start looking at cost and energy efficiency then we need to appreciate what is the gap between the highest possible efficiency and the systems that are there today
we will come to that and before that let's look at the purchase cost of a product so we make an air conditioner air conditioners until a certain time were purely driven by marketing features and price so it was in the year 2005 we started an initiative with the bureau of energy efficiency about labeling and we discovered that there was absolutely no regard for energy efficiency in terms of um, uh, point of sale customers were not aware and there was no clear data so the catalogs were hazy one manufacturer had a set of standards where he would use the lowest allowable performance by the indian standard and design products to that another would design it to true capacity both were being rated in the market in a very similar way one, one and a half ton is one and a half ton so when we went through the process and we'll cover it in one of the lectures how we, how we went from the transition from the consumer not knowing what he's buying in a very quantified clear manner in terms of what matters to him to taking it to a point where it was mandatory today every air conditioner in the country is labeled so i had some role to play when that was being done along with the the manufacturers stakeholders from other industries and all that and it will be a pleasure to go through it in one of the um, sessions that we have so initial cost and therefore price was driving it and then it is a combination today so the lowest life cycle cost so how do we get the concept of a life cycle cost in the air purifier we are looking at the cost of replacing filters in case of an air conditioner we just looked at how much it costs to run the air conditioner so we look at the total life span what is i mean when i ask you the price of a 1 and 1/2 ton air conditioner what number comes to your mind 30000 somewhere around that right and we found the running cost was how much so it would now you could actually contest and i want all of you to put your thinking caps on and contest the assumptions i made because i was trying to make a point so i would have exaggerated the number of hours and all that and maybe hidden something from you guys right you can always assume that and then try and come to a realistic understanding of what it is so what are the things you will use you will say that the the compressor cycles so a 1 and 1/2 ton air conditioner is running with the compressor on some part of the time off some part of the time so you'll factor that you'll find out how much the power the compressor will take and how much the fan will take and you can do all those sort of refinements but you will not be able to <coughs> go very far from the number we got and therefore we need to become appreciative of the concept of life cycle cost for air conditioners more than other appliances and when we start looking at that then we start looking at technology which will give us the lower life cycle cost so when people are paying more maybe they are aware that over a period of 3 years 5 years they will recover the premium they have paid because the energy cost is going to come down that that is what drives the inverter air conditioners and and if we have the time we will include that also in our discussions in subsequent lectures now <clears throat> why did i bring in energy efficiency and and, and the or touched upon the bureau of energy efficiency experience because if a market is left to itself then it does not move in the direction of higher energy efficiency so we need regulation we need some kind of pressure some are saying how can we make people um, adhere to law we need something like that so once you say that this date onwards you cannot sell an appliance with efficiency lower than this number you drive technology and it's just not true for india even in california many years back when i did my btech project i did some benchmarking for refrigerators technology was stagnant till one state in the us said that yes we are going to mandate now that you need to have this energy efficiency for a refrigerator so they went by defining for this size you cannot consume more than this power and there was almost like a revolution most companies r&d budgets increased they hired more people and they developed efficient systems before that there was no drive so legislation has a very important role and when there is legislation one has to also keep in mind that you can not simply define a very high number so you want the best air conditioner take the best technology in japan and say this is what you're going to do because then you deprive a huge part of the population in their ability to satisfy their needs they want at an economical affordable value so so that is why we show this chart where it is possible to look at a relationship between no oh, are you able to read it so the legislation lever is defining the minimum acceptable performance of an air conditioner and the purchase cost we know will go up 
when we improve energy efficiency. The moment we start looking at life cycle cost, we will have an optimum. And that optimum could be the point which we could use from the legal stroke legislative part. Now we come to the Connaught cycle, which all of you are familiar with. And the key point here is that we have uh, a reversible process for both uh, taking heat from the source and throwing heat to the sink. And then we have isoentropic uh, compression and expansion. Right. So now, has anyone heard of any machine that works on the pure Carnot cycle? It is impossible, right? And how do we appreciate that it is impossible? Right. So it is it is a concept that has been created to define a limit. Right. You will normally need a temperature difference if you want to. Let's take an air conditioner. You want to reject heat in the condenser. The temperature of the refrigerant inside the condenser needs to be higher lower than the environment what should it be it has to be higher right for the condenser condenser is the part which rejects heat to the environment so it has to be higher so that delta is there i mean as a necessity and then it is related to cost so you want a small delta you will have a large heat transfer surface area but inherently because you're going to have a finite size of the heat exchanger you're going to have some part of irreversibility. Same thing goes for the evaporator. And then we also know that we do not have compressors which will do isoentropic compression. The closest is the expansion part, which also follows in a capillary of fanol line, maybe in an expansion valve it might be isoentropic somewhat. So, what we have in reality is even if you look at it theoretically, it will be the inverse Rankine cycle. And that is plotted on a pressure enthalpy diagram here. Now, there will always be a difference between the theoretical optimal cycle where we have taken care of um, adiabatic compression and we have factored in uh, the two straight lines taking care of heat rejection and um, uh, heat removal at constant temperature. Now, before we go any further, let us see how much is the opportunity in terms of our ability to improve systems. So, I have looked at uh, air water heat pump using refrigerant R290 <coughs> and if we make an assumption of uh, uh, the differential temperatures of 2 degrees. So, heat pump is basically something we look at uh, in an environment like today. So. So, we want to pump heat from the environment to the room. And then we look at residential air conditioning with a refrigerant 410A and we take um, a certain temperature inside and then a certain temperature outside. So, you will notice that there is a major opportunity for improvement of energy efficiency in all these systems. So, we first relate it to the need as an economical, as a commercial need and then we see the opportunity that is there in today's uh, systems. And this is basically a design opportunity. So, if you want to look at pure air conditioning product design, then here is an opportunity which, uh, which is existing across the range of products. to appreciate the practical considerations that we have. So, the practical considerations that we need to be aware of are like we talked about the temperature needs to be higher for the condenser, it needs to be lower for the evaporator for us to take uh, heat away in case of a cooling application. And we will always have a ratio of uh, the two. So, the penalties of all components inefficiency will be factored in the real COP. Now, do we have a point?
pointer or maybe I can use this. So, let us say that the gap no, my pointer will work right. So, let us uh, look at this part. So, if you want to keep the room at 26 for comfort, can we really operate the cycle at 26 evaporating temperature on, on, the, on this pressure enthalpy diagram? Yes, no. So, we will need to keep it lower, right. Now, how much lower and what would be another uh, constraint that would determine how much lower? We also need to remove some moisture from the room. We are all breathing. So, for comfort applications, we will have a certain latent load. So, put together the two will determine the evaporating temperature and in most comfort applications, this is uh, between 7 and 9 degrees centigrade. So, you can notice how this evaporator, which is a heat exchanger, is going to introduce an inefficiency just because of the delta T required to transfer heat and to have a reasonable size as well as remove moisture from the room. <coughs> now, let us look at the condenser. There again, we need a temperature difference. So, before energy efficiency became a big thing driven by uh, standards, uh, products would be designed at 55 for an ambient of 35. So, that is a big inefficiency. And what can we do? On the condenser, there is no constraint about having to remove any moisture. So, we can play with the size. So, at a higher initial cost, there may be opportunities for reducing the condense uh, for reducing the overall uh, life cycle cost. What else can we do? The compressor will have an efficiency, which is a function of how well we do the compression process and what motor is used. So, the motor will add to some inefficiency and there again, there are compressor types. So, the next time we meet, we are going to look at different compressor types and what are the advantages, disadvantages of those and how do they compare with each other on energy efficiency. And uh, there is uh, one thing which is pretty consistent with what we want, right? the expansion process which is a straight line on the Carnot cycle, on the Rankine cycle, inverse Rankine cycle and also in the practical cycle. So, what is missing over there? See, we never recover work in the expansion process in all commercial systems. So, we simply expand the fluid. So, the inefficiency contributed there is because we have never recovered any work, whereas that opportunity exists, just like we did work in the compressor to pump fluid from one temperature to another, when it drops down, that opportunity was there. All right, now we looked at, um, see this is going to be a little tough because it is theoretical and you are not dealing with systems yet, so, so you do not have the hang and feel of. Um, of the variables, but look at an air conditioner. We design it for let us say 35 degrees because that is what our standard says, that is what the international standard says. You design it for 35 degrees centigrade. What happens in real life? We will have peak temperatures on a hot month, hot summer month, say 46, 47 during 2 to 4, and then the temperature will come down and it might touch 31 midnight. Now, what happens to this cycle? It will keep varying because with the temperature, the theoretical <coughs> cycle will also change and the practical cycle will also change. So, each component need, need just not be optimized for a particular defined condition, but needs to be able to handle the variation. And now, it becomes an engineering problem, which someone who is purely there for the fun of it would say, it is not complicated, I maybe I will just not get into it, I will do something else. Or someone who is really interested will put together all these variables and see what it takes to optimize and design a system that will provide the best life cycle cost over the varying conditions. So, you know some of us can get excited about uh, making simulation programs and putting in 
relationships that help us predict what is going to happen. So, one of the things that works in design is let us say 2 to 3 percent of the time you are going to experience high ambient air temperatures outside. So, 46 to 48 is going to be no more than 2 percent of the time in a year. We can define a weightage which is low for that condition and allow for a relatively inefficient point of operation there. And then we look at what is the maximum uh, number of hours. So, we find that the maximum number of hours are between 32 and 34. So, we start focusing our optimization efforts to get the best energy efficiency for that condition. And all the time we are keeping an eye on the life cycle cost, not the initial cost. So, today the state of technology is that such systems are available which have been optimized, but unfortunately they may not have been optimized for the climate of India. They may have been optimized for the conditions in Japan or for the conditions in the US. Wherever there has been a market large enough to appreciate the value of uh, low life cycle cost that has been there and the opportunity for India exists. We take our temperature conditions. It could sometimes mean uh, tweaking the, the algorithms that drive the compressor. It could also mean choosing different compressors, different size of heat exchangers, all that. And all this should lead you to start you know, thinking what all goes into the product design when you are making an air conditioner for a specific need. Okay, now, we looked at components. We can also look at some degree of control. The moment we bring in a compressor which can have varying capacity, there is an opportunity to run the compressor faster, slower depending on the need, the cooling need. So, the cooling need could be lowered at night. You could run the air conditioner all the time at a much higher point of efficiency, then cycle it on and off and, and lose the energy efficiency um, opportunity when the compressor is off. So, so what happens is a conventional one and a half ton product will run at its capacity of 1.5 tons or whatever is the rated capacity with the change in conditions. So, 1.5 ton is at a certain specified condition. So, at night it would be a little more. So, it runs and then it stops, runs and stops. Whereas, if we reduce the speed of the compressor, we are running it just at the required load. And then if you have a 0.5 ton compressor in a large system which is 1.5 ton, you will get a much higher point of efficiency you will have the condensing temperature come down, you might want to use the evaporating temperature go up for a certain duration and then you might address the humidity concern a very different way. Whenever you find the humidity rising, you lower the evaporating temperature and then bring it back up. So, then there is some algorithm sitting inside the control systems working for the most optimum point of operation all the time. And that means we need to start thinking of computer programs and algorithms and sensors. So, that again gets into components for air conditioner product design. We have uh, already covered it, but this slide kind of explains a little more clearly the shifting conditions uh, for different components. The best available cycle for a particular set of conditions will not follow uh, the <coughs> cycle in varying conditions, but if we have the ability to change the compressor capacity, then it is possible to follow the best available cycle. All right, so I think this is the point at which we can uh, close. So, this will be my concluding slide for the session today. And this is to bring in a perspective of climate and energy. When I have talked to you about uh, different uh, air conditioning uh, considerations for components, the one part we have not touched upon is the refrigerant in any significant way, except when you looked at the possible um, efficiencies. So, the refrigerants have been known to contribute to <coughs> the ozone depletion and therefore, they are an environmental concern and there was a an agreement, international agreement to phase out all those substances that deplete the ozone and that has been more or less implemented across the world. Having done that, another concern came up and that was global warming. 
and that is the new issue and some of it we will touch upon in our next class and we will also look at components for refrigeration and air conditioning product design. So, so the, the flavor of the next lecture is going to become a little more detailed around components and we will pick up from here the global climate energy challenge and we will look at what are the ways to offset some of these threats to the environment. Right. So with that then I would like to conclude. <laughs>